From the TBD studios, let's talk live with your hosts, Natasha Barrett and Melanie Hastings. And also coming up, getting your kids some help. Find out if they're suffering from a common disorder that few people know about. Personalization disorder impacts almost 25% of students, but so few people are really aware of it. So what is it, and how can you protect your children? Medical journalist Jeffrey Abigail has been looking into DPD, as it's more commonly known, and he has some important advice for you uh, about your teenager. This is pretty interesting, Jeffrey. I didn't know much about this. Um, first, let's just define what DPD actually is. Uh, depersonalization disorder has been in all the diagnostic manuals around the world for decades. It's been studied for about a hundred years. And in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Big Mental Disease. Big fat book that, yeah, that all technical. the shrinks look at. <laughs> yeah, it, it's listed there under dissociative disorders. But in England and the, the rest of the world, it's under different uh, anxiety disorders and things. So it was a little discussion as to where it should be. I guess that's why we really haven't heard about it a lot. Well, one reason that we haven't heard about it has been was relatively obscure until the last 30 years or so. It was caused primarily by low-level stress and people who had a predisposition towards it. But they found in the last few decades that it can be triggered by certain drugs. And these drugs include marijuana, ketamine, uh, and predominantly ecstasy. Which and, is, and then the things you name, a lot of recreational drugs that students are taking right now. Well, the use of ecstasy in the last two years has grown 67 percent. Now that's a dramatic increase and ecstasy is one of the primary culprits that can trigger DPD. So, they, so you found through your research and others research that uh, there are kids out there just using these drugs here and there and this can trigger DPD? Uh, if there is a predisposition in an individual towards depersonalization, mm -hmm. it will trigger it or it can trigger it. There are many people who develop depersonalization disorder with no known trigger at all. Now, you went through this um, yourself. I went through this for uh, 11 years back in the 70s. And oddly enough, it takes a person an average of 11 years to find a correct diagnosis. Describe of what you were going through, the feelings you had before you knew what exactly it was. One of the things about depersonalization disorder is that it's virtually indescribable. So people have to describe it in terms of as if metaphors. Okay. So it's as if I'm losing my mind. It's as if my mind is separate from my body, which is a dissociative aspect of it. Um, there's also a period of emotional numbing. It's as if I have no emotions. And basically the loss of the self. I feel as if I have no self, I have no personality. I, yet you're always aware of this. It's a phrase. But not a, no, not a depression. Not, not, it's not, not depression, like although, although many thousands of people have been misdiagnosed with depression or with um, any number of other mental illnesses when in fact they're suffering from depersonalization disorder. So is this something in families where it runs in the family of depression or mental illness that the, DPD could also surface? There is some evidence uh, that it can be in a family, but there are many, many cases where there is no evidence in the past at all of any kind of mental illness. Uh, as, and I said, obviously there are many people who do all kinds of drugs all day long with, and remain immune mm -hmm. to it. But there is in the brain a predisposition towards DPD. In many people, we don't know the exact number of people, and these things can trigger it, but so can various degrees of stress. During the 11 years you were dealing with it, how long before you realized or were diagnosed and, and got some help? It was 11 years until 11 I received years. the diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> I managed to meet a very uh, brilliant psychiatrist when I was living in California who was familiar with it. Mm -hmm. And to date, there are still very, very few specialists around the world who are familiar with it. Now, what happened in the 1990s, it began to come out of the woodwork with websites that people created for sufferers of depersonalization with information about it and research. And that's what's kind of changed the whole face of it. To my knowledge, this is the first television show in history to actually mention the term depersonalization making disorder. Making history here. You may be making history, and hopefully it will continue. How do people know that others are going through it? Because the, the characteristics that you described were so broad about what you were feeling, and obviously they could be diagnosed as depression and a number of other things with, with doctors and their patients. Can other people, like when you were going through that, 
Would I be able to see it in you if I was a friend? Very often friends, family never suspect that anything is wrong because people with depersonalization become masters at maintaining a front, putting up the normal appearance. One of the uh, symptoms of it is people feel as if they're acting like a robot, as if they no longer have a soul, but they're just going through the motions of life. So they are still able to go through the emotions of life. The only difference is they may not laugh as much, they may seem more withdrawn or preoccupied. They may, because uh, excessive rumination is also a, a symptom of it, there is an overconsciousness of the self on the self. So they're trying to put on a face. It's like Always. when you have a bad day, but bad example, this might work. You have a bad day, you're putting on they that put act on to get through the day. And part of it, going through the motions is a way of maintaining one's sanity because it's proof to yourself that you're not crazy because you can still do the things that you had done before. But internally, there, there's a great deal of suffering and it's a very painful disorder. And to date, uh, there are two clinics studying it, one in New York and one in London. And so new research has come out in the last 10 years. And in my book, a Stranger to Myself, um, I go into all the new research and virtually cover it from all different angles. It's pretty interesting. Jeffrey, thanks yes. for coming in and talking about it. Once again, his name, um, well, we know your name, the mm -hmm. name of the book, Stranger to Myself. You can Thank go you. get it for more information. Good to have you on. Thank you very much.